I'm just impressed with how much better Gould looks now. <laughs> <laughs> than, than what? Yeah, compared to what? <laughs> He's photoshopped himself. Yeah, it's a body double. Hey, man, go easy on my skipper. He looks good. Sure does. He does look good. The gun went off this three Don, ago, you know. This is Don Trask check, checking hey. in. All right, Don. <laughs> wow. Well, hey, Don. Wow, there's a whole... Okay. <laughs> now we can start. Yeah, yeah, we've been waiting for him. Roll All it, right. Danny. All right, well, so uh, Susan, I'm just going to jump in and look. I, I didn't realize there's like two other pages of people. There's a lot of people here tonight. So uh, welcome. I, apparently you had nothing better to do on a Tuesday night, but uh, this is a uh, this is a great, um, great thing. And I got to thank uh, Susan, ERC, I mean, whoever put this together. You know, what a great idea to, you know, be innovative and, you know, come up with uh, an awesome group of people and, and a bunch of people who are interested in, in hearing some of the stories. So I'm going to turn it over to Johnny Tullock here in a second. But uh, before everyone got on, we were talking about what you guys are going to talk about, stories and stuff, and sinking boats. And it triggered a, triggered a uh, memory when I was like 1987, 1988, maybe. I think the first year I was a member of the St. Francis, I was doing race committee for a starboat regatta in the circle. And boats were coming back, and it was windy, and it was ebbing, and it was gnarly. And uh, <clears throat> I was on a Mark set boat, whatever. And there was, of course, a boat sinking, and we got them under tow, and we were starting to pull them over towards uh, the city front. And they wanted to go to Alcatraz, and Matt Jones was following us in the wee willy, saying, "No, take them to the city front." And they were beelining it over 45 degree angle to Alcatraz, so we just took them to Alcatraz. And there was a ferry coming in, and there was a swamped starboat with all the shit trailing behind it. Um, but we, we saved the boat and, uh, that was my first and last time on, uh, Alcatraz. Uh, and it was a fun <laughs> story to be able to share with you guys. So, um, have fun tonight. Welcome. I'll turn it over to Jenny Tullock now. Thank you. Thanks, Commodore Dana. And, um, have to reiterate, thanks to Susan for, for setting this all up so that we could virtually gather when there's less sailing. I have a similar story of wrecking a, a 29er on an island in, in Sydney Harbor, not quite San Francisco Bay, but I will leave that to another side. My dad is here, so I know that he'll um, remember that with unfond memories. Um, so about the star class, I have spent a lot of time watching and commentating on it. I have yet to actually race one. I was telling the panelists earlier, I raced Yinglings and 49ers. So I think my ankle tolerance is almost as high as some of you guys. Um, but when Susan asked me to host this panel, I was really excited to hear some of the stories that will come out tonight um, from members and, and non-members alike. Um, a little bit of housekeeping first, as Susan said, if you guys could all please stay on mute, except for the panelists. If you have um, stories or questions, please do share them in the chat and we will get to them. Um, but otherwise, we got a, a big group of amazing panelists here. So let's get into them. And if you want on your Zoom to go into gallery view so you can see them all yourselves. Um, panelists tonight include Don Trask, Bill Chrysler, Paul Kayard, his son Danny Kayard, Doug Smith, Steve Gould, staff commodore Doug Holm, and Ken Keefe, and I think a number of others of you will weigh in at points as well. A uh, little background and history on the star class. It has held a world championship since 1923. It was an Olympic class from 1932 in Los Angeles all the way until 2012, um, skipping just one Olympiad in 76. And the Star Worlds themselves have been raced here on the Bay four times, um, 34, 78, 92, and 2006, which is the first time I got to watch the Worlds and was a very, very cool world. So I'm sure many of you who raced there. Um, reviewing the list of the podium at each Worlds is honestly a who's who of sailing, as you guys know, and as many of whom you can see have joined us here tonight. Uh, the most successful St. Francis Yacht Club member in the class was Tom Blackholler. He won the Worlds three times, um, 74 and 80. Oh, sorry, twice. Um, got second in 75 and third in 78. Um, his crew in two of those times was Ron Andreessen and Ed Bennett joined him in 78 and David Shaw in 1980. Um, Paul Kayard, who's with us tonight and one of our panelists, won the Worlds in 88 and finished third two other times all with Stevie Erickson. I think Stevie's not joining us, but another legend in the class. Um, so quick question for you all. I love to do a little icebreaker. And if you have access to your keyboard, go for it. Um, 
when you win the worlds, what does enable a, what does winning the worlds mean? And I'm sure that Paul Kayard who's here can tell us what that means, but many of the rest of you, anyone want to jump in? Doug, you unmuted. Gold star on your main sale, Paul Manning. You got a gold star for answering that the quickest. Yeah. So, um, so exactly. If you win it, if you win a world championships, you get a gold star. If you win some of the other championships, you get to have a silver star in your main sale. And you get to be like Rick Peters, says Eric Doyle. I don't know. Rick Peters has renamed himself the Starboat guy here tonight. I mean, anyone can rename themselves on Zoom, but you nailed it, Rick, with the naming of your I can't see you in my gallery, but I saw that earlier. Well done. That's my handle. <laughs> oh, nice. Handle for life. I love it. Um, okay, so let's start with our panel. And um, of course, let's start with the youngest first. So Danny, you're up. Uh, how many Star Worlds have you raced in? And um, what was the most special one for you? Well, I've only raced in one. So that's a pretty easy answer to the second part of the question. Uh, my dad and I did the Worlds in 2017 in Svenborg, uh, Denmark. And that was, of course, special to be able to do it with your father and um, and close to my other side of the family, which is my grandfather who's also a star sailor. So that was pretty awesome for them to come down and watch as well. What was your one best takeaway from your dad for, for that period of time racing? Um, probably when we broke the mast on the first day, that was an exciting day and just learning how to navigate the middle of the pack, which is where we were. It was a wind, wind, windy regatta and we, uh, of course, are light. And um, so we were in the back a little bit. And, there's a lot of wake and submarine and uh, just learning how to steer in that kind of a situation when you're coming to the Lord Mark. It's a tough one, but a fun one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Paul, we'll go to you. The opposite side of that coin, perhaps. How many worlds have you sailed in in the star class? I'm not sure how many worlds I've sailed in. <clears throat> Something in the high teens, I'm sure, maybe 20. Um, I want to correct uh, the first two worlds I sailed as a skipper, I sailed with Ken Keefe, who's on this call, and we got third both times. Um, I think I've been third five times. Um, and uh, actually, most recently in 20, must have been 2018 in Oxford, which was pretty good. I felt pretty good at almost 60 to be third. Um, and with Danny, it was, it was a fantastic opportunity to sail. He, He's not boasting. His grandfather's also a gold star winner. Um, and he did come down to Denmark and watch us sail together. And it was super windy. And it was probably, you know, I mean, as on all these things, it's a team. So I should have helped Danny. We should have got the mask back a bit more. But he's he's right. We, uh, we were sailing a Lilia, too, which is a different kind of boat. A lot of you guys know. But it's, it's a submarine as every bit as much as a P-Star. So... We got down to the bottom of the second run. It was pretty chopped up. We were in about 20th. We were doing pretty good. But uh, when I went forward to get the pole down, the bow went under and the boat just simply sailed under. I've mean, broke a lot of mass in my time. I've broken way more mass than, world, than I've been in world championships. Um, I even broke one with Doug Holmes on the goddamn trailer in the trying to get it out of the garage one time. That was about 40 years ago. But... Um, Anyway, this one was special because we simply sailed the bow, the bow down about six feet underwater and the pole didn't, nothing hit, nothing, normally you break it with the pole or nothing happened. The middle of the mast just left. The lower runner broke and the mast at the spreaders just kept going forward and we stopped. And so the whole thing just kind of crumpled down on the deck and we just got the tow line out and towed in. That was Danny's first mass break. Oh no, first and only, hopefully Danny. Doug, I saw you doing two at that point in time. Did you break two masks in, on land with Paul? Cause that's- an no, one, no, one we were sailing. Okay. Yeah. Did we break- We were one? in the middle of a jive and KR said, Holmes, don't jive. It was too late. I, I think I might've broke, honestly guys, at least 30 masks. <laughs> I broke a lot. Only in the star boat. Other masks in other boat. The same feeling every time. And it only happens downwind. But uh, you just look at it, you look at it, and it bends a lot. And some, you know, obviously sometimes you save them, but it bends, it bends, and you're just sitting there and you go, oh, damn. 
and the <laughs> transom lifts way out of the water and it just goes boom back down in the water. That's it. I already learned something. I, I'm just not being aggressive enough downwind, I think. <laughs> How many masks have yeah, you but, pulled? Uh, only one when I thought I could finish a race without an intermediate. Wow, you're kidding. I love it. It's going to be eyes open for whenever you guys make this fall event happen, which needs to happen. That was a discussion earlier about when the star racing is going to come back on the bay. I'm going to be out there watching for who is trying hard enough to bring a mass downwind. Although who knows, in fall, it might not be windy enough to have that happen. All right, Doug Smith, I'm going to you next. 11 world championships that you've raced in, um, guessing all over the world. Which one was your favorite um, and why and how did it go? I think probably the first time we raced in Puerto Cervo. Um, Gould was there, Paul was there. Um, I, you know, my biggest memory was rounding, we were out practicing and we started heading downwind and I managed to put the boat immediately into a death roll. Um, and my crew looked back and said, is this gonna be a really fucking long week, Smith? <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> but did you answer yes or did you say no? <laughs> I was I was too busy trying to figure out what the hell was going on to even answer that that question at that time. You should have just blamed Marty. Marty, whatever you're doing, do something different. <laughs> it needs to be said that at that since he brought that up, we were at that regatta and the Saturday before the first race is when Tom died. Yeah. So it was tough for all of us St. Francis members that were over there to get that news. Um, I'll never forget, you know, where I was. It's one of those things where you never forget where you were when you hear a certain kind of news. Yep. Yep. Pretty sure. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to skip a question I meant to go to. I'm going to go to you, Don Trask. And it's, um, the question is any good, SF Bay Area stories and the kind of second prompt is um, Black Holler sinking a star on San Francisco Bay. So can you tell us that story? I'm sure there's plenty of us that would love to hear it. Yeah, I can. I think the first short story that I'd like to relate is um, I moved over from Lake Merritt Sailing Club and chartered a starboat from David Bowles. It was an Etchells. And we brought it to the Yacht Club. It was Jimmy DeWitt and myself. The first time we put the, the boat in the water, it was blowing hard on a Saturday. And we pulled the main up and both of us looked at the top of the mast and said, oh boy, that's a big sail. And we went out and sailed for the first time. Uh, Tom was the, was the uh, best in the fleet, uh, fastest of all. Uh, it was a real challenge. Uh, we didn't do very well at first. And one of the things that really uh, excited us was that Tom had a, uh, on, the, on his transom, he had a, um, a teak bird that he had gotten from somewhere. And it was on a spring in the back of the transom. And he had a little string to the bird. And if he passed you going upwind, or if he passed you going upwind, uh, you would go by his turn and he'd flip this little bird up and down. And that, that really aggravated us. Uh, that kept us going for a number of years. Finally, I think we got uh, a bit better. And the second year, we were able to qualify to go to the World Championships uh, in San Diego. Um, and I went with Jim DeWitt. And I think we took 15th or so, but it was, it was our first attempt. Uh, I can remember when Tom sank, Bill Chrysler was aboard with me on, on uh, our starboat, and it was in the trials. It was going, the, the trials for, for the Olympic trials in Kiel, Germany, and they selected the Berkeley Circle as a perfect venue, high wind, a lot of big waves. And uh, so that was the Olympic trials. And I can remember uh, Denny Jordan had a big, big 50 foot sailboat and my wife was out on the boat that day and they recorded winds of 50 knots and going up wind, we were probably in, maybe in the top 10, I guess. And, 
black hole that was just a little bit in front of us. And uh, we were bailing like crazy. We had bailers in, in both uh, uh, chines. And uh, Bill would pump for as long as he could pump with, right hand, with his right hand and then change it to his left. And he would give it to me and I would pump. And we were behind black hole by about, oh, maybe five boat links. And all of a sudden, it looked like, gosh, we're catching him. Look at the bill. We're catching him. Look, Bill, we're catching him. <laughs> and he, he sunk right in front of us. <laughs> and <laughs> Bill Munster was his crew. And I have the pictures that Bill Munster gave me uh, when he went up to Portland. And uh, it shows the boat uh, with the transom up with Tom holding on to the transom with the name Good Grief. Just holding on to the transom. It's a perfect picture, and Bill Munster is off on the side with his life jacket on, and the boat is pretty straight down, and the mast is maybe uh, four or five feet above the spreaders, and that's where the water was. Um, I don't know if they, I think they probably re retrieved that boat. Uh, I don't remember what happened then, but uh, that, was, that, was a, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> I remember asking you if I could stop bumping. Yeah. Yeah. You knew the answer yeah. already. Why'd you ask? I was exhausted. <laughs> been pumping for like all the way around the race course. Yeah. So we had that, was a 72, that was a 72 trials and I was running a whaler helping the race committee. And I had the pleasure to get Black Holler and Munster in the whaler. And Munster oh, was a big fellow without a life jacket. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure it out. So we put the whaler bow into the waves and let Munster roll right in the front. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next morning, Black Collar called me and said, we got to go and find the boat. What do you mean? So we went out the next morning and there the boat was sitting, masked up, spread her out of the water on the Berkeley Circle, and we tied a fender to it or something. And a day later, a diver came and got it and got it out. Yeah. I got something, I got something to add about that race. That Just to give everybody an idea how hard the wind was blowing. That was back in the day when there was no limit to the amount of wind, as long as, you know, I mean, it didn't matter how hard the wind was blowing. Once you start, you start. And, uh, and we, going to the reaching mark, was so windy that it was hard, really, really hard to, to jive. I mean, hard and dangerous and boats were going around and struggling and usually boats would tack. And Dennis was sailing that year and Dennis had won, I think, I don't know if he'd already won the worlds once or not, but anyway, Dennis Connor, he got to the reaching mark and he tried to jive and got about halfway and rounded up into the wind tried to jive another time, got about halfway, rounded up into the wind. And then he just sailed in. We were sailing out of Treasure Island. He just sailed in and said later, he said, you know, if I don't know how to jive a starboat in that much wind, I don't belong in the Olympics. So it was windy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a that's a point. He, learned to, he learned how to jive a starboat in extreme conditions. And I watched him do it in a practice race in Mobile in a water spout going by. And he claimed he learned it on that day because what he did was he did a full on death roll to windward. Um, so then when he was bringing the boom across, it hit the water, not the backstay. And he, he said, oh, that gives you plenty of time to get the, get the, the rig around and take off again. Seemed a little extreme to me, but it, he made it work. That would work. Okay, well, speaking of, of watching people doug this one's for you there's a there's a comment about you having a memorable finish off the club while someone was inside having lunch in the main dining room watching you can you tell us that story yeah well when i first moved out here i was um sailing in the winter and i didn't quite understand the tides that well um oh you're talking about the other other screw up i had yeah that was the time that i put it on the beach in one of my one of the senior partners in my law firm was sitting at the corner table and I came in on Monday morning and there was a note on my desk asking me to see him and he said yeah I watched that whole thing. Okay and what was the second story? What was the first one you tried to start to tell? Oh the, the, the first time I uh, got flushed out the gate and 
got pulled back in by a fishing boat. I didn't quite realize what was going to go on. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's cool to sail out under the bridge and, you know, in the winter and, you know, it was kind of a fun day to sail. Didn't quite figure that one out very well. So I have a question for, for Don and Bill. I have long heard a story that you guys were, were um, T-boned by a fishing boat um, on the city front. I, I'm sorry, yeah, on the city front, right in front of the club um, and came up on opposite sides of the bow of the fishing boat and the star sank. Is that true? Uh, that's, that was, I wasn't with, Don was, yeah. Don, you tell him Jeff was, yeah. Jeff was with him. Yeah. Oh yeah? My son was with me. And yes, we were coming down. We were going up uh, just off Golden Gate. And uh, we were hard on the wind, starboard tack. We had the main pleated, the jib pleated, and Jeff was uh, mini hiking over the side. And this Monterey fishing boat uh, was coming right down the coast. And uh, we thought, yeah, what's she going to do? He could he could take our stern really easily. He could go over our bow if he just turned the helm just a little bit, but he was con very confused. You can see him in the, in the wheelhouse and he was going back and forth trying to figure out what, what, what it was, how it was gonna do. And I asked Jeff to get out of the mini hike, get up. And he ran right in the middle of the boat, right at the backstay. I pushed Jeff uh, aside uh, up to the shrouds the guy pinned my arm against the main and pushed me oh, three or four feet up into the main. The boat was cut in half. You could see the fishing boat had gone all the way down uh, to the keelson. And so definitely the boat was going to sink. It did have a little bit of flotation on, but not much. So I yelled to Jeff, Jeff, we've got to get on this guy's boat. And so we both jumped on the on the bow of the boat as the guy backed away from the boat and we ran back to the cockpit and I asked the skipper, I said, do you have a line and do you have a life jacket? And he said, yes, yeah, sure. There's one right there. So we picked up the line and the life jacket and I tied the line to the life jacket. And I thought, now if you can get close to the boat, I can tie this on top of the, on top of the mast and we can find the boat. It's not going to sink. And it's probably going to sink in 20 feet of water, 30 feet of water. We should be able to find the boat. Well, then I thought <laughs> we tried to maneuver the boat and I could see that that was going to be a disaster. If I jumped in the water and tried to hook the uh, life jacket and the rope to the top of the mast and then have him pick me up, I'm sure that would have not been a, a good <laughs> a good finish to that, <laughs> that day. So we just circled around the boat as it sank. And we went into the harbor and we dropped him off. He dropped us off at the, at the, at the guest dock. And we said, uh, where's your boat? Where you keep your boat? And he said, I have a berth on the other side uh, on the finger out from the, from the harbor master's office. And so I said, do you have insurance? And he said, no, no, myself and my partner are unemployed employees of the San Francisco uh, school department, I think, and we don't have any insurance. And I said, well, that's going to be a problem. Uh, we had built, we had built this boat. This was a, I don't know how, how old the boat. I don't remember how, what number it was, but anyway, we, uh, I talked to my attorney and he said, well, we have to go to the, the uh, for a judgment against him in the uh, Marine court. And we did, we got a judgment, got the boat. And they had an auction at the steps of the courthouse. And they said, if anybody would like to uh, buy this boat, they could step up. We started the bid and we thought, boy, there are a lot of fishermen around here. This will be interesting. Maybe they'll, maybe this will pay for my, pay for my, uh, my loss in star boat. And it started at about 3000. I said 3,500. Somebody else said four. Somebody else said, 42, I said 45, and nobody else bid. So I ended up with a boat at $45,000 and a sunken star boat. Uh, I took the boat uh, back to its berth because the berth came along with the boat, which was a good, that was a good find. And um, I had some 
the employees at the laser factory come over and uh, clean up the boat, clean out the cockpit, throw away a lot of junk, and painted the boat. And so it was a good-looking Monterey fishing boat. And I said, oh, I can sell this. I put it in the Chronicle for Sunday paper, advertised uh, Monterey fishing boat. The first call I got, <clears throat> the fellow said, I just want to know the name of the boat. And I said, okay. And I said, it's Raggedy Ann. I said, oh, Raggedy Ann. No, thank you. And he hung up. The next person called 20 minutes later and said, uh, I just want to know the name of the boat. I said, Raggedy Ann. And he said, oh, thank you. And hung up. The third guy called. And I said, wait a minute, before I tell you what the name of the boat is, do you know the history of these boats? He says, oh, yes, I do. He said, tell me the name. I told him Raggedy Ann. He said, oh, God, you know, that that boat is a, that you're going to never sell that boat to a fisherman. That boat is the boat that Joe DiMaggio's father fell off the boat outside the Golden Gate when they were fishing. And they found the boat the next day with the boat circling around it is circled with the diesel with the diesel still on, and the dog pacing back and forth in the cockpit. <laughs> so no, I never did sell the boat for a couple of months. <laughs> Finally, I put it back in the paper. A Stanford student called and said, uh, "Yeah, I would really like to have that fishing boat. What is it worth?" I said, "Well, if you can come up with four thousand dollars, you can have the boat." So he said, "It'll be a perfect boat. I'm doing a, a thesis." Uh, on shrimping in South Bay in the 20s and 30s. <laughs> well, he bought the boat. That that got that was a that was a at least I got out of that boat. <clears throat> but that was not a that was not a very good experience. That wasn't enough to pay for oh, the, the start boat. Off. And the boat the the boat sailed along. Uh, jib was set. The main sheet was set. It sailed along in the bottom of the bo- uh, of the bay, and it at about eleven o'clock that night, it poked its mast out of the out of the water. My Jeff, uh, my son Jeff was at the yacht club having dinner, and they said, "Oh, there's a boat coming out of the out of the water that sank." And they ran down it. It was that star boat, and it came up to the beach, and it was blowing all oh, blowing a good maybe twenty knots out of the west, and the boat continued to sail onto the beach. And as it sailed onto the beach, everything started to break. It just fell apart. So the next morning, we got uh, a tow truck from uh, the shop that was in front of the laser facility. And uh, he came over, and it had a grandfathered keel. So we wanted to save the keel. And we took, we towed the keel out of the, out of the water, saved that. And John Hutton was the photographer at the time. He was a doctor at, at um, the Presidio, and he was a doctor that was reviewing all people that fell off or that jumped off the bridge. He wanted to see uh, what the trauma, what the, uh, trauma uh, condition of the person after they pulled him out of the water for some reason. And he later was transferred to Washington, D.C., and he was Ronald Reagan's personal doctor. Uh, he took a lot of pictures at the Yacht Club. He was one of the guys that, that could go anywhere in the Yacht Club, uh, take a picture. And uh, it was published on the, on the front of um, one design, and he had a lot of great pictures. Anyway, that was a – we did get that keel up anyway. <laughs> that was another boat. An incredible story. I yeah, feel like grand, grandfather, that means that Don it does a special work to it. Yes, that's right, Doug. That's right. It, <laughs> yes, it was a little bit different than other keels, and so <laughs> and we wanted to make sure that we saved that. <laughs> I was going to ask for, for our final sinking story tonight to come from Paul Kayard, but it looks like, Paul, you just moved off the screen. So if you can still hear us. Um, let us know. Other, oh, yeah, he's there. You're muted, though. Um, something in Berkeley Circle and your boat and the final, the final, maybe the final sinking story of tonight. Who knows? There might be a oh, couple more coming out of Woodworks. Not really sinking. Are you asking me? Uh, what happened? Uh, yeah. The mud run. The oh, mud yeah, run. Kenny, yeah. Kenny, Kenny, Kenny Keefe tells the mud run way better than I do. That's right. He had a better seat. 
<laughs> yeah. He didn't no, even get you wet have out to understand, of it. in those days, Care and I were splitting the bills 50 50. And the whisker pole cost $25, maybe $45. So we're going down the run. And I tell Paul, I think the ley line's okay. We can jive for the mark. And Paul says something, you know, like he normally says, like, are you sure? I said, well, I said we can jive for the mark. So I jive for the mark. And it's really windy. And we're not making it, which means we have to jive two more times, which means that Paul's really upset. And Paul knows I don't like to sail heeled over downwind because it tips over and it breaks our whisker pole. And I got to spend $20. So he bears off to the mark as I'm putting out the pole. And we're a quarter mile away. And the boat rolls over completely. And so I'm thinking, well, shit, the first thing I do is get my whisker pole and put it away. And then I kind of notice the backstays aren't right. So I pull the backstays and the mast doesn't break. And then I turn around and Paul's not in the boat. I said, shit. So what should a good crew do? So I took down the mainsail, right? Because it's windy and I'm in the boat by myself and I want to break the mast. So I get the mainsail down and our buddy John Dane's coming down the run. And I think Paul and I were pretty far ahead. We might have been a minute or two ahead. And um, Dane comes by and picks Paul out of the water on a full plane. And then he's come by, they come by me with just a jib up flapping. And Paul jumps in the water and I pull him in the boat. And he says, God damn it, why'd you take the mainsail down? <laughs> now you need to remember we were wearing, and Chrysler and Trask and all the boys did this. Uh, we were wearing 44 pounds of clothes and Paul wasn't wearing a life jacket. I, my, my harness had a life jacket. So I, it was a little bit scary, right? Because, you know, Paul was in the water, 44 pounds of clothes, windy day and no life jacket. And Dane was smart enough to get him. And, um, so we finally get to Lured Mark and Paul is talking about everything that I couldn't really understand, but it was a lot of words and some <laughs> of them weren't very nice. And uh, so he has this brilliant plan. We're gonna go around the Lured Mark with just the jib. And as we go around the Lured Mark, I'm gonna pull the mainsail up and he's gonna put it up in the wind, but it's a little hard to feed it in and to pull it up and to, you know, not fall off the deck and everything. And he's saying something about something or other, very confusing. And we <laughs> finally get the mainsail on the lock. And or no, we're going around, right? And Vince is coming in on a plane, yelling and screaming at us that he wants room at the mark where we're trying to get the mainsail up. And we're just trying to survive, right? That's all we're trying to do. And, um, and Vince is yelling and screaming at us he wants room. So we got to let Vince in the mark and all that other crap. And uh, for all the people who know Vince, especially Rick Peters, it's Paul, I'm wanting to found some room in the mark. <laughs> and I look over my shoulder, you know, we've been swimming, we've had the main up, we've had the main down, there's mud coming down everywhere. And I'm looking over my shoulder and I go, oh, and now we got to give this asshole room. <laughs> Fuck. So here comes Vince on a, fl on a plane and it goes around the mark and we come around and stick the thing into the wind to get the, the main up and then keep going, Keith. Then we pass the little Brazilian Zats going back up to the finish, right? And, uh, but the sad part of that story was that was our favorite mast and we didn't break it. And so I took it to Sparcraft because we'd just done, we'd been, just finished with America's Cup and I got all the boys at Sparcraft in LA and we jigged the mast up and we straightened it and it looked perfect. And we used it in the four, first four races of the Olympic trials and we're really slow. And it took us a long time to figure out that that was the issue. And we switched to the other mast and damn near went on and uh, had a good trial, but it didn't really work out because the mast just bent around the mast ramp and didn't realize that the aluminum was just gonna have a memory to it. It's worse well, than, the mud than, get than all we over didn't them. realize because- yeah, you forgot about the mud. Yeah, well, the mud. <laughs> but it was worse than that we didn't realize. We asked our mentor, remember? He came down there to Long Beach and we said, Tom, 
okay, this is what happened. We straightened the mask. What do you think? He said, oh, it'll be fine. Well, Buddy Mel just told us the same thing. Everybody was telling us, no, don't worry about it, you guys. It's in your head. Yeah, you're just young guys. Yeah, well, we sailed home from the circle. You're right, Doug. We sailed home from the circle. We're mini hiking, sailing home from the circle. And we're looking at the top of the mast. And we didn't realize at the time, but the first foot of the mast is full of mud in the mainsail, right? We're hosing it off as we got back to the dock and not really realizing that we probably screwed up our mask, but. But well, Don's on here, I have to, with Steve Jeff, we sailed the first, um, our first worlds in 78. And I was always so impressed to be able to sail against Don in that P, uh, Pacific Coast Championships there was Don, Tom, Dennis Connor, Bill Buchan, Doug Holmes, and Paul Caird. Um, it was an incredible Billy Gerard. We learned so much. We learned how to sail so quickly because if you could go sailing against Don and Tom and Dennis, it, Bill Buchan, I mean, it was just an experience that you don't get anywhere else. And, you know, we were, whatever we were, 20 so many years old and just trying to figure it out. And, you know, learning very early that Dennis would adjust his shrouds on the way in so you wouldn't know the shroud tension. And I <laughs> we were trying to figure out how to tune the damn rig anyway, right? But Dennis is, you know, adjusting them. And then, and then we learned, you know, how Don and um, Tom communicated, which was always interesting. And, um, <laughs> And uh, it was just an incredible learning experience and gave us the tools to, you know, learn how to sail any boat. Don, I think we need to learn more about how you communicated <laughs> with Dennis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, or are they words that can't be shared tonight? <laughs> There was a huge rivalry between, uh, uh, let me comment on that a little bit, because I, I came up to crew for Don after I met him in Cleveland and he invited me to sail more and I was in San Diego and I started crewing for Don and I had no idea about the rivalry between the two. And I remember racing on the Berkeley Circle and there would be like, you know, eight or nine, maybe 10 starboats. And it was almost always Don and, Car and Tom or Tom and, and Don. And it didn't matter who was ahead of who. As soon as we got on the reach, if you were close enough to love the other guy, you would do it. And it wouldn't matter how many other boats passed you. I mean, we could end up going from first and second to 11th and 12th. And it was, it, it, they could care less. And I remember times you know, everybody knows the Berkeley Circle. I remember times when we were at Red Rock, head to wind, holding Dot Tom up into the wind. And then he was trying to get behind us, slowing down. We would slow down. And he would go ahead and we would go ahead. And it was just, that's just the way it was for years. It was, it would go on, it went on like that. It was incredible. And, but what it did was it made them both really, really good. I mean, it, you know, I don't think either one of them would have gone on to do as well if they hadn't had each other to, you know, sort of bang heads. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, Don? Right. yeah. Yeah, that's right. But it was fun though, right? Think, we had some good times getting yeah, pissed off. Okay, as off. we got better and Tom was still the, um, the best starboat guy, we uh, both wanted to go to the Worlds, but you had to qualify in your fleet to go to the Worlds. You had to be number one. Two fleets. So we finally figured out that we should form a, an East Bay Starboat fleet. So I joined the East Bay Starboat fleet, and Tom had the West Bay, so he could go to the Worlds, and I could go to the Worlds. So that worked out pretty well. Before that, I can remember one time when we had the elimination races in Richardson's Bay, and Tom and I were a bit faster than most of the other guys in the class. And we did a lot of America's Cup starts against each other. Uh, not very many people were doing those kind of things at, that, at those 
those days, but it was pretty effective. And if you could get the guy going away from the mark, below the mark, um, you could keep him away by being very close to his transom so he couldn't harden up and tack. You'd stop him that way. He couldn't jibe and harden up, tack. And we brought him pretty far off the off the course and let the start of the of the eliminations go. And uh, we knew that we could, the two of us could catch most everybody if we didn't get them too far away. So I had uh, another crew by the name of Don Coleman that was on the boat and we got on Tom's transom and we took him away from the starting line. And pretty soon he was yelling and screaming, come on, you got to get back to the start. You got to get to the start. And we just kept on his transom and kept going down further and further and further. And every time he'd come to windward on one side, we'd stop him there. He would jive and go to windward on the other side. We could stop him there. Finally, I said, Don, okay, we're going to go back. We're going to start. And I want you to just keep your eye on Tom. And every time he tacks, I want you to tell me, okay, he's tacked because we're going to cover him like a blanket <laughs> and I hope we can catch the rest of the fleet and maybe put one or two boats between Tom and I, because we were one, two on points to go to the worlds. And as we went back up wind and tapped on Tom, every time he tapped pretty soon, Tom was yelling uh, some very good swear words and would tack again two or three more times. And pretty soon we looked back and Tom is kneeling on the deck uh, with a paddle in his in his hand, waving this paddle. If I could ever get you, and he would use this uh, <laughs> derogatory <laughs> words. <laughs> and uh, it got worse all the way up the weather mark. And finally, we got to the weather mark, and we had caught uh, one or two boats, and we passed a couple more. And I think we beat Tom uh, just by one or two points, and uh, had a qualified to go to the worlds <clears throat> and on the way in Tom and Jerry Mull were just, they were frantic. Tom was just, he couldn't stop ranting and raving. And we got to the dock and K hard. I know uh, his crew, uh, I forget who that was. It was Gary Mull. Uh, Gary Mull. Yeah. Gary Mull. Right. Yeah. yeah, Gary Mull. Yeah, and Gary held Tom back, and Don Coleman held me back because it looked like it was going to be kind of a, a problem on the dock. And Tom <laughs> yelled, "I'm going to, I'm going to protest you and uh, Ralph DeLuca because you've both been out trying to team race me, and it's against the law. That's, I'm going to protest both of you guys." So he said, "Oh, I'm going to write my protest up," and he gave his protest to Bob Hall who was kind of officiating uh, for the regatta. And I wrote my protest up and I, I used every swear word that uh, came out of Tom's mouth uh, a number of different times and I've heard different ways. I filled the whole protest form up with, with that kind of language. And Bob Hall got the, got, the, got the protest and he said, oh, this is way too much for me to handle as a, as a race committee. I'm going to give this the board of directors at the yacht club. <laughs> the board of directors got the got the call to to uh, uh, see what might be done, and uh, he went to the board, and they called Tom and myself up to the board meeting, and they called Tom in, and they read the protest to him, and said, "Now, is this true?" and I said, yes, I, yeah, I'm afraid that's true. You said all those things. Yeah, I'm afraid I did. And they said, look, Tom, this is the last time we're going to warn you. You've been on the edge a couple of times. If this happens again, you're going to be out of the yacht club. But for the meantime, we want to have a little punishment for you. I understand that you were going to go. You were qualified to go to the Mallory Cup in New Orleans. Is that right? He said, yes, I'm qualified. He said, Club said, well, we want you to go, of course, and represent the Yacht Club, but we want you to take both uh, Ralph DeLuca and Don Trask as your crew. <laughs> well, that, that was not a good idea. That, that was not going to work very well. 
And we went down there and we sailed on some sort of a ensign, I think. It was terrible. And in terrible conditions, I think we were we were pretty back. We were pretty far back in the fleet. But uh, Tom, and, Tom and I got along fine. Uh, Ralph DeLuca was a little bit slow on his on his tactics, and, and uh, we kind of kept him out of <laughs> out of the conversations. But uh, we did terrible in the regatta, but we got along pretty well there for a while. Did that change and anything? Bill, you, can tell, you can, Bill, you can tell the story about Tom Blackhalter coming behind you at, in New Orleans when we were having a um, what were those? What were those? It was not the, the little lobsters. What do they call those things? Anyway, Crayfish. we had a. a yeah, crawdads. Yeah, the crawdads. Crawdads. Yeah, and they put yeah. the. Yeah, they, I don't know. I, I the, that 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 got pretty dicey, Don. I don't know if that's a good story to tell. In, you know, mixed company okay. like All this. Right. I, but yeah, I, you're right. <laughs> but it was uh, it was this, it was interesting. It was a great it was a great rivalry. I mean, it was a classic sort of rivalry that you hear about. And in over the years, you know it. The two guys mellowed, and I think they got they respected each other. I think that they got to be, you know, pretty good friends. And at least they had such a history between the two of them that 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 um, that anything short of that was kind of a relief, I guess. And yeah. so I don't you think, Don? I mean, you you and you and Tom got along pretty well after. Uh, yeah, I think we did. Uh, yeah, I think we did. Yeah, I agree. I think it was very good guys after in after the 80s. I think it was really a very special relationship between the both of you. Yeah. yeah. And how much they all uh, how much the two of them all helped all of us. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah it made it made the whole, you know, it, it raised the level of, of, of the sport in, in spite of the fact that it was Kind of hard at times, but Tom uh, Gary used to call himself the ship psychiatrist. <laughs> oh, Don, the, you well, guys I... must have you guys must have changed your relationship because there was one year when we sailed in the J twenty four with you and I and Ed Bennett and John Neasley and Tom Blackhaller. Uh, yeah, J24. yeah. Before, <laughs> what did he owe you to get on that? Uh, no, we, we just we were. Good enough friends and competitors that we could we could talk to each other about anything. We could talk about rules, or we could talk about the fleet. Uh, and I asked him to crew with me in that regatta. That was a regatta that was up and down the, the west coast. I forget what it was called, but I think we won it six or seven times. And uh, uh, that was that was very interesting. Uh, one other story that I think was kind of would be interesting is. Um, Let's see. When I uh, I was sailing starboats and I had a wooden Eichelob, and uh, we had won the Bill Chrysler and I had won the uh, North American Championships in Cleveland, and we brought it back and somebody wanted to buy the boat, so I said okay, and I was going to get a bucking boat, which was one of the first fiberglass boats, and mine was an old wooden boat, an Eichelob, very good boat, very flat, very fast on the reaches on the Berkeley Circle. And I had already contacted uh, Bill Buchan and said, I want to buy a boat. Send me your color chart. And uh, he didn't do it. And uh, over that weekend, uh, Carl Peterson showed up. And I didn't know Carl. He was from Vancouver. He was a uh, Swedish boat builder. And he had built uh, a starboat uh, mold. Danish. Don, Don, Danish. 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 He'll roll over in his grave Danish. listening to that. Yeah, you just made him yeah, yeah. In, his, in his coffin. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, right. Yeah. We had some great, some great sure. times with Carl. Anyway, uh, so he came down and said, look, I want to build you a boat. I built three starboats for guys in Vancouver, and none of them know how to sail, so my boats are never going to be desired. I need somebody that has had some sort of reputation like yours. And if you could buy one of my boats, I might be able to sell a few more. So he said, if you want to help me supply the, uh, some of the labor and uh, 
and the cost for the, for the material. I'll go up and get my my mold. You have to send me a truck and rent me a truck. So I, I gave him a <laughs> truck and he went up there and got his molds. And we got a, a garage uh, in Belvedere, just off the highway at the at the no, no, Corte Madera. Corte yeah, Madera, Madera behind the and, car wash. Yeah, well, Belvedere. Yeah, Corte Madera, yeah same different. place. Anyway. <laughs> And it was a, a garage that was just big enough to put only the deck mold in or the hull mold in. You had to keep either one outside. Don't and they have a car a wash in Belvedere? <laughs> I think they do. Uh, yeah. And it, anyway, it took us four and a half months to build this boat. And uh, uh, the next big regatta was going to be the, the, uh, uh, the Bacardi Cup. Uh, Western Corn Hemisphere Cable. Championships. Yeah, yes. So uh, I, I wanted to go to that, and I asked my dad, who was 63 years old at the oh, time, right. could you crew with me? He said, yes, but I don't think I want a mini hike. I, he said, but if, you're, if we're doing good in the last races or the last upwind leg, I will, I will mini hike for you, but you can't. He was very, um, he said, you can't reached down and helped me back into the boat. So that was okay. So we went to Miami, uh, I think 75, 80 boats. And uh, at that time, Don, we had a rule. Don, yeah. Don, I should tell everybody, your dad was a world champion swimmer. At age 65, <laughs> he was still like winning races. So anyway, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So uh, we went there and at that time, the rule or uh, wetting up or wearing sweatshirts, et cetera, was if you could only wear uh, a certain maximum, no matter what the conditions were. You could wear three sweat tops sewn together and three uh, cut off sweat pants sewn together. But you had to leave every morning from the dock with dry clothes. So you'd come to the breakfast, you'd have your dry clothes over your shoulder, you'd jump in the boat, you'd head off, from the yacht club and you get a couple hundred yards off the yacht club and you throw your sweats in the bilge and you open up the bailers and when you got out to the starting line you could put these wet clothes on it didn't gain really a lot but it helped a little bit and we'd come in and if, the, if you've been to coral reef yacht club they've got a nice swimming pool and a, a kind of a beer garden with a hamburger joint at the end of it and all these crews and these Crews were big guys at that time. They were big football players and, and uh, you know, 230-pound crew, 240-pound crew. My dad was about 190. I was about 190. And uh, we would go in and we'd have maybe three races in that day. And they would be good, hard, tough uh, races. And we would get to the pool and all the other crews would get a, a, a hamburger or two and a couple of beers and we'd go and sit at the tables and say, God, that was a hell of a, that second race, it was really windy. That was really, that was tough sailing. And my dad would go to the end of the pool and he would slip off his sweat top and he'd pull down his sweatpants and he had a little Speedo trunk on. <laughs> he would dive in the pool and he would do 30 laps. <laughs> and the, the crews would look and say, who, who is that? Who is that guy that's 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 Trask's dad. <laughs> he was he was classic. It was that was a that was a good that was fun. Anyway, um, I take it up too much of the time. <laughs> no, I think everyone loves it. Um, okay, we're talking boat building, so I'm going to go now to to Greg Seek. Um, you say as a crew, you sail the boat your skipper brings to the regatta. Um, can you talk us through? some of the differences you notice sailing different boats and then happy to hear other people's thoughts on. Oh yeah. Boat. Well, I mean, they're all, they're all a little bit different. I'm not sure what you, what, what story you're, you're talking about, but um, you know, I, a lot of people uh, know that I've sailed with, uh, with Steve for 30 plus years and we've had, I don't know what, five or six boats, Steve. You Se think? Seven, I think. Seven boats. Something like that. Yeah. A couple of them were fast, and some of them were not so fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about it. I think that's that's probably the the notion is is you 
you but the I, I think the the story was when we went to um we went to sardinia and and the boat that we had ordered was not quite ready so we were delivered um another boat a different boat steve that uh that foley built for us that was from a different mold i think <laughs> and it, it was an experiment be, an experiment and it proved to be experimentally slow uh we gotta say uh but um uh, about midway through the regatta, uh, Steve was having a conversation with, with Foley and said, this boat seems to be really slow. And uh, Foley said, no, you're just too big to be in the back of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Which I disagreed with. Anyway, that's about it. All boats are different. <laughs> Steve, you look like you want to add on to that. Well, I, you know, I sort of have to correct that because that was actually... <laughs> The uh, where was that? The boat. It was. Yeah, we were we we were fifteenth there out of one hundred and ten boats, and that what we were complaining about was the boat was a it was an experiment, and uh, it was fast upwind and fast on the runs. It was just slow reaching, and that's what the that was the conversation that we All had. All right. Okay. On Andrea, uh, but it was it and and we never saw a boat that looked quite like that one again. So uh, the the experiment worked in the sense that I guess they decided not to build any more of them. We never saw any more reaching legs again either. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> right. I'm, I'm thinking we got to ask them to go find that mold. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> it's ahead of its time. Exactly. You don't need to go fast on the reach. <laughs> Last regatta yeah. for reaching legs. Um, anyone else want to weigh in? Favorite boat types, differences between? Paul and Danny, I'm looking at you here, but also Doug. Yeah, I can say I don't like Lilia's pretty <laughs> emphatically. <laughs> I, I chartered one. I chartered one after the okay. I can. What's that? This is Trey Gillius, and I have a question for Danny. Danny, you might tell us about the new uh, star built by Sune Carlson, by Leif Carlson in Sweden. Yeah, and yeah. Um, it's time for yeah. us to all get a Sune Carlson star and get active on the bay, maybe, huh? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's pretty much a P star with some slight variations. Um, they figured out that there were some, a little bit of issues, but I mean, Leif's having some issues as well that he's working through, which is good. And he's got a good boat yard over there. Um, so it's, it's good. You know, it's nice for, I think, Northern Europe to have a new manufacturer like that and someone that's active in the class again and bringing back kind of the life to Scandinavia. It's great. The Danish fleet is really growing. And uh, while I was living in Sweden, we really brought up the fleet in my grandfather's neighborhood again. He put in a crane which is extremely generous. Um, so we could sail back in the river that he kind of learned how to sail in and race stars in. Danny, while we have you, um, people have written about the Calvin Page regatta in the chat and that's hopefully upcoming this October for everyone who wants to come. Um, but tell us about when you sailed it with your high school sailing partner, what's the story there? Yeah, uh, well, that was the first, it was the first summer that I sailed starboats with my dad um in 2015 and we did the whole d5 series and then i forget why my dad didn't do the kelvin page um but anyway i had the boat and i asked my high school buddy miles gudenkunst who i sailed in high school with and if he would want a crew and that was some real i mean my dad and i are light but that was even lighter so but it was fun uh you know doug and steve and greg were there and I think we were actually hanging in there upwind, but I, I was telling my dad earlier that I can vividly remember just getting a, a lesson in downwind sailing uh, from Steve and Greg, because any time that I was lucky enough to be ahead of them at the weather mark, they would just rocket past us. And it was flooding, super flat water, but very windy and uh, just did not know how to get the boat going in a steady manner. So that was... Uh, it was a good learning experience, that's for sure. But unfortunately, I think that was the last Calvin Page that there was. I think it was, sad to say. Yeah. Is it coming back? Who's in charge of that? Staff commoner, Doug Holm, you've put a Star Worlds together before. First off, tell us about that. And then secondly, let's see who's taking on Calvin Page this year. 
Well, we can do that. Um, well, that's kind of where we started out, Jenny, before we officially got going. But um, with the NARS last summer, we just sailed um, from Golden Gate up to uh, just uh, before a black hauler and back. And in reality, watching the America's Cup now, it's kind of stadium sailing. And, uh, you know, I think it'd be a pretty good place to, to sail starboats, not in the middle of the summer, but certainly in the fall. So maybe we could organize that if, uh, if the club's back in operation in, in, the, in the fall. The executive race committee chair has said that we can likely add it to the weekend of October 16th and 17th. So the district five secretary and Lawson are gonna talk. Good. Awesome. There's about eight guys that said they'd come already in the chat. <laughs> That's super exciting, you guys. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. It's got a lot of thumbs ups for, for right. that happening. Trig, um, you gotta, Trig, you gotta get a boat, come on. You guys know with this group, talk can be cheap sometimes. <laughs> That's right. What's this new Italian? What's the new Italian boat that is a deck step mast? One K production. Is that is that a Foley or a Lilia? It's a Lilia. Oh. Sound of it, sound of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is uh, just. Uncomparable there, Doug, when you heard it. Yeah, come on. <laughs> I, can tell, I can tell you guys are all over that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. A couple of final questions here. And guys, for the audience, if you have any other questions that you want to ask, put them in the chat. Um, Paul and Danny, the Vintage Gold Cup, you've still together in that event. Can you tell us about it, the event? And hopefully we'll have that as well coming soon. I'll defer to my father for that one. <laughs> Um, the vintage gold cups, a really cool thing. Don would Don, we should get Don out there for sure. Um, we had Malin Burnham sail on it. It's basically the boats are wooden. They have to be 50 years or older. Um, I bought Derwood Knowles gold medal winning boat from 64. It's a <clears throat> Etchell, Skip Etchell's boat, built at old Greenwich boat company. And, um, Danny and I won that event together maybe in 2018 and um, <clears throat> they didn't have it last year because of COVID but anyway it's it's fantastic we're up to about 30 restored boats um, <clears throat> and they just keep them out there in Michigan they don't really travel I'm doing a bunch of work on my boat probably the most expensive star boat I own is that one not the not the $70,000 P star that I have so uh, <clears throat> like all good pieces of furniture, you know, you end up dumping a ton of money into it, but it's going to be beautiful. It's getting refinished right now. So it has an all new deck and I put it back to the color scheme that it was when Derwood had the boat built when he won the gold medal because <clears throat> it had gone through various owners and various iterations. Um, but it means a lot to me and I'm going to, that boat will be passed on to Danny and, you know, I think for us and our family to own a piece of star history like that is really cool. And so investing and preserving it <clears throat> in top shape is, you know, something I'm happy and proud to do. So um, Paul, hopefully we'll be able to do that many, regardless of this year. It's, it's the last weekend of September. Oh, nice. How many star boats are in your fleet or your stable right now? We have three. Three, okay. You know, Paul, what you ought to, ought to do is for that fleet, you ought to let the boats wear their awards rather than the skipper, yeah. because that boat would look so cool for Olympic gold rings. I remember sailing against that boat. Mm. Yeah. That's a great idea. Four, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll pass that. That's great. That's great. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, um, and I just want to say one other thing while we're all on this call, and I, Don, I hope you got my email, but um, Don Trask was hugely fundamental in my uh, growth as a sailor way before Tom got a hold of me. And um, <laughs> Don and Packy Davis were running the junior program at St. Francis when I was about 14, 15 years old. And they really took me and Kenny and Bertrand and Silvestri under their wing. And 
Don particularly gave us, you know, he was building the lasers then, and he used to give us the run of the laser factory to go over and pick out our equipment and the club paid for the boats and the club paid for a van and a trailer for us to travel up and down the West coast. And, <laughs> you know, we really, we had the North Americans in San Francisco, I think in 77. And it was just a very form formable format. Uh, you know, it was like Kenny said before he touched on it, it was so important in those years to us. And I just want to thank Don while we're all here on this call, um, Don, thank you for. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that comment. Don, well, we have one more from The laser slalom, the Elmstrom regatta, all those oh, things that Don pulled oh. off. Don, one, one more Bill. question for you from us. Bill Chrysler said this right before you came on that every year you say this is your last year. <laughs> sailing and yet this year you have it it sounds like a new boat and no plans to have this be your last year so um what is your new boat and what are what are your current sailing plans yeah i just sold two j70s and uh, i thought this is about time to this is about time to hang it up i went for a regatta at the first of the year there's a ice bucket regatta we which we've won for many years and and uh, I took my good normal crew and we took third and I got back to the dock and I said, Jesus, we took third. We used to can win this regatta. What's wrong? And I thought back and I said, you know, I wonder how, how long is I how long has I, have I been sailing? And I looked back and thought, well, let's see. I started Lake Merritt and I was sailing El Toro's and then Snipes. And I looked back and I said, yeah, see, that was about, yeah. That was 75 years. <laughs> said, yeah, it's time for me to quit. Well, uh, I couldn't quite quit. I, I uh, have uh, another boat uh, that I just purchased. I just bought a, uh, a J80. No, yes, a J80. And I'm putting it together now, and I hope I can get it together in time for a regatta pretty quick. So anyway, I can't quite give it up. Fantastic. Well, let's, let's hope that you don't. Um, all right, you guys, we'll, we'll leave that with our questions for the group. Andy Mack, I'm going to put you on the spot really fast. Someone has asked me to have the district secretary give an update on West Coast sailing this year. So if you could. I'd be glad to introduce you to Nick Madigan. <laughs> he's, a district, he's a D5 secretary. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong guy. I'm so out of touch. Okay, right. <laughs> so what happens when you miss a meeting? Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Secretary. I would like to first thank publicly my assistant secretary, Rick Peters, who's a marvelous guy and does all the work. I'm just the, I'm just the uh, face man in this deal. So we are working on a calendar for everybody. As everyone probably knows, we're going to have the North Americans in Newport um, in August. And uh, I think it's the third week. Uh, 18 through 22, and uh, what, we're, what we're planning on doing is if we can't get a sanction for the silver event because of borders and the like, like last year, we're, gonna we're still going to have a regatta. And like last year, we'll also hold the Baxter Bowl the weekend prior. So if anybody wants to come down and sail in Newport for two weekends in a row, we'll have two dare and then either a three or four dare, depending on whether it's sanctioned or not. And we really, it really worked out well last year. We think we had about a dozen boats for each event and the club was very accommodating. Everybody had their own space in the yard. We brought food out to the boat yard so people could social distance and do all that. And I think anybody who came would agree it was a, other than the weather, which was very hot and not a lot of wind, um, at least probably thirds of the days, um, it still was a good sail and just great to get on the water. The rest of the D5 calendar is in flux because of COVID, and we're going to try to publish something here in the next, uh, by, by the end of February. So look for that either through Gerilyn on the website or through ECL and Rick on their email bombs that they send out to everybody. And um, we're going to try to space the regattas out and kind of jigger things around. As you guys may know, the J70 Worlds are still scheduled for Cal Yacht Club in late July, so or early August. And so we want to make sure that we deconflict all this stuff 
and keep the King of Spain and the lifting cup on the calendar, but not right on top of each other. And I'm super excited to hear all this buzz about the Calvin page. I've been listening to it for since about 7.34 this morning when, uh, when, when uh, Doug or, or Steve uh, uh, emailed me. And uh, I think it's super exciting. And uh, it would be really fun to get that regatta back on the calendar. Um, the Rollins Bowl will go down on its traditional weekend. And uh, we're uh, in deference to Ruth. We're going to continue to hold it on Memorial Day weekend. And so San Diego seems a uh, game that's really kind of the first thing that happens on our swing. And uh, so if uh, we don't see it before then, we'll hope to see you in San Diego on Memorial Day. Thank you. And th it would be great to get Calvin Page going again. That would be awesome. And I know Greg's worked really hard and let's, uh, let's, let's get it back on it. I think, we'll it's a done, I think it's a done deal. We've got the, uh, we've got the head of the race committee on this call. So I think, I think it's done. Put it on the calendar, man. October 16, 17. I don't know. We we'll probably won't get our own start, but that's okay. We go sailing. That's fine. Yeah. Nothing puts a smile on your face like uh, racing on San Francisco Bay. It's awesome. Very much so. Awesome, you guys. Well, well, thank you for getting those dates on the calendar, for letting us know other ones. And I hope to see a bunch of you out there October 16th, 17th, 18th um, for that regatta. Uh, just want to say, again, huge thanks to our panelists for joining us tonight. Huge thank to all of the guests, members, and, and club guests alike. Um, shout out to the three gold stars, Zabo and Eric Doyle. We saw you guys sneak in here as well. So um, thanks for coming. And then thanks to Susan Rooney for setting this up. I think you've got a laser class one next month. So for some of you who are here and not just super star passionate, but passionate in general for sailing, uh, make sure to keep your eyes and your Zoom calendars open um, for that. And Susan, I'll let you take it away. Okay. Yeah, uh, March 2nd, Tuesday night, we're gonna do the laser class next and uh, gonna try to do uh, J105s and NARS and kites after that. And then hopefully we'll be running racing and we don't need to do Zoom talking about racing. But um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jenny, for playing host for us. Uh, Don Trask, thank you so much for getting all of these people out sailing and, uh, um, and all the stories over the years. We really appreciate you calling in. I know it's late back in North Carolina. Um, so we'll wrap the formal program now. I can leave it open for another like 15, 20 minutes. If anybody just wants to stay on and chat with each other, I am going to stop the recording now, though. So. You will not be recorded if you uh, say anything after this. So thanks, Susan. Uh -oh, Great job. Thank you, guys. Great. Really appreciate Thank your you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Great time. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.